welcome to the Horsemanship Breakthroughs podcast, a source for riding and training insights with the goal of helping your horse be a light, happy, and willing partner. I'm your host, Amalia Dempsey, a mainstream equestrian rider who discovered natural horsemanship and equine learning theory, and now I help riders like you achieve connection and communication with your horse so you can have more fun and fulfillment whilst prioritizing the partnership. Get more learning resources, including my free connection and communication mini course at AmaliaDempsey.com. Click the follow button so you don't miss an episode. And if you're enjoying the podcast, please leave me a rating and review or screenshot this episode and share on social media. I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to episode 32 of the Horsemanship Breakthroughs podcast. Help your tense, anxious, nervous horse be more calm, relaxed, and confident. We've all either seen or experienced a horse who is tense, anxious, worried, fearful, spooky, etc. Their head is high, their eyes are wide, their ears are pricked, their nostrils are flared, they might be cooling out, they've got tense muscles, maybe they're sweating or you can see their veins, they're standing upright ready to flee, they might look really athletic and impressive, They feel like they're a ticking time bomb. They don't feel present. It feels like their mind's completely elsewhere and like they're not even aware of you either on the back, on their back or on the ground. They might be bumping into you or thrashing their head, pouring, rearing, or trying to pull away from you. This is an extreme example of a horse who's worried or tense, anxious, but there are definitely some more subtle versions of this tension, which I'll talk about in a moment. So when a horse is in a tense, anxious, or worried state, no matter what uh, what part of the spectrum they're on in terms of that level of anxiety, it's really difficult for a horse to focus on you when they're feeling like that, which means it's really hard for us to communicate with them, which means that we can't really teach them anything, which means that we can't really progress in our training and towards our goals. And also, it's really hard for us heart-centered equestrians to watch our horses in this state. We want them to be relaxed and comfortable. So different horses will show their tension and anxiety in different ways. Some horses, it's really easy to tell when they're anxious because they'll show you. You know, that's like uh, what I was describing before with a horse that's completely over threshold and tense and it's very obvious to everyone, even a non-horsey person, that that horse is worried. Other horses and horses who have a smaller level of anxiety or worry, it's a little harder to tell sometimes. Just because your horse is standing still doesn't necessarily mean they are not tense. In fact, those that stand still can be more tricky because it feels like all of a sudden out of nowhere something happens, but really there was subtle tension all along. We just didn't really notice it or address it. In other words, they can be in a state of freeze and they actually are really worried, but they're just going internal. So there really is a large spectrum of tension and anxiety in terms of how it shows up in horses. Uh, An example of a a horse who's showing a sign of tension could just be you're leading along and they stop. And then they're telling you in that moment, I'm not okay about something. So just them changing their movement can be a sign of anxiety. And if you push through this tension, so if you're a rider and you're maybe you're a gung-ho rider, It's usually not very enjoyable to ride a horse who is in a highly strung or tense state. Even if you are a gung-ho rider, you're probably, whilst you're probably able to stay on and ride the horse through it, you're probably not going to have a productive session unless you can help that horse find some relaxation. Also, if you're riding a tense horse and just carrying on and ignoring their tension, It's kind of like trying to have a conversation with someone about their posture, but they've actually got a snake wrapped around their leg and they're more worried about that. So obviously the person's mind is going to be about the snake and removing that and they're really worried about that. 
and you're trying to say, oh, you know, shoulders back and um, heels down. It's like, well, no, that, that, that's not the forefront of their mind. So it's much easier to have conversations with a horse about their posture, about their movement, about our riding goals when they're in that relaxed state because their mind is more open to think about other things. So in this episode, I'm going to share with you some ideas to help tense, anxious, nervous horses be more calm, relaxed, and confident. Now, a little disclaimer, something I've noticed and something that quite honestly sometimes prevents me from sharing my knowledge is that my opinion is always subject to change. So in my journey, in my horsemanship journey, I'm always evolving as a trainer and a coach. But I know that the information presented in this podcast has helped me with my own horses and my students. So I trust that it will help you too. But also I know that in one, five, 10 years, I might have a different idea or better ideas about how to help a horse be calm, relaxed and confident. Another disclaimer, please, if you feel like you're in a dangerous situation with your horse, get professional in-person help. Okay, so I have seven general areas that I want to touch on in order to help your spooky, tense, anxious horse be more calm, relaxed, and confident. So I'm going to work through each of those seven sections. Um, I did do a huge brainstorm of absolutely everything I know about helping a horse relax, and I uh, kind of categorized them into these seven areas. So I'm hoping that it makes logical sense to you, and you can work through these seven areas with your own horse and see where you might be going wrong. So the first step is, does my horse have a relaxed life? Okay, so if you if your horse doesn't have a relaxed life, it's going to be pretty hard for them to show up for you in a relaxed state. And what I mean by a relaxed life is, are your horse's basic needs being met so that they can be relaxed about their lifestyle? So even in humans, I'm not a psychologist, but I do know that when humans are anxious or depressed, one of the first things that psychologists do is try and tick off the human's most basic needs. You know, are they eating healthy? Are they getting enough sleep? Are they socializing? Are they exercising? So all of these things that humans really need to thrive. Horses, a lot of our guests on the Horsemanship Breakthroughs podcast have spoken about the three Fs. So the three most basic needs for horses. Freedom to move around. Forage 24-7, are they able to eat 24-7? And friends, are they in a herd environment? Unless your horse has those three basic needs met to the best of your ability, then it's like, do not pass go, do not collect $200 for my Monopoly players out there. Um, You really need to make sure, in my opinion, that your horse has those basic needs met if you want them to be a relaxed horse to be around. So... The way that um, I like to think about it is, is my horse happy when I'm not there? Because most of the time our horses don't have us there with them. Most of the time they're by themselves. Maybe a couple of hours a day we're with them if we're lucky. So when my horse isn't there, sorry, when I'm not there with my horse, are they able to interact with other horses? Do they have shelter? Are they comfortable with their environment? Do they have plenty of room to move around to get up into even the pace of a gallop? I really want to make sure that my horse is happy before I even show up. So let's set things up so it's easy for our horses to be happy and relaxed when we do show up. And I've seen some amazing changes in horses when owners simply change their their environment so that their basic needs are met. So step one, please make sure that your horse's basic needs are being met so they have every chance possible to be a relaxed horse. Another note on does my horse have a relaxed life, if your horse has any underlying medical conditions or pain, that can prevent them from being relaxed as well because, well, we all know what it's like to be in pain. It's not really a relaxed state. So uh, horses who have uh, medical conditions that prevent them from being able to move around freely, to be able to um, live a normal life, that can cause some chronic anxiety as well. So just a little note on that. 
The second point I want to make is for you to think about why is this anxious, tense, spooky behavior happening? So I've said it before, I'll say it again. Horses are not naughty, right? They show behaviors that we perceive to be naughty, but they're not doing it out of malice. They're not planning and plotting against you. And horses don't pretend to be scared. Horses are prey animals. They're flight animals. Their natural instinct is to run away from things that they're worried about. So if they're showing you signs of flight or freeze or fight, which are the horse's kind of defense mechanisms in response to something they're afraid of, this is natural and normal behavior. I do think horses can learn to be more spooky um, in that, you know, they're worried about something, they perhaps get pushed through it or they spook and get punished for it. So sometimes um, they can kind of create more anxiety about being anxious. So um, I do think they can learn over time to be more spooky, but it's not necessarily them going, oh, well, I'm going to pretend to spook today so that I can get out of work. I don't really believe that horses do that. I think that horses are always telling the truth in terms of how they feel about something and they're not pretending to be scared. So, so horses don't lie. If they're acting tense and anxious, they're fearful about something. What they're worried about could be various things, which is what I want you to think about. And in general, I like to um, think about when the tension is first showing up, which I'll touch on later. But what they're worried about could be a variety of things. It could be lots of little things compounding, which in the horsemanship community, and I think also in human psychology, is called trigger stacking. You know, it's kind of like um, you, when you have a bad day, it's usually lots of little things that add up over time rather than, you know, it can be one big event as well, but trigger stacking talks about lots of little annoyances or fears adding up to a point where then you explode, you know, then you um, bite your husband's head off when you get home and it's he's like, where'd that come from? But really all day you've been slowly been getting annoyed and more tense. It can be one big thing like a spooky corner of the arena or a dog or a car. Um, horses can be afraid of their humans, their equipment or certain tools. I also think that horses can get anxious and tense and confused um, or uh, they can get anxious and tense when they have confusion or a lack of understanding about exactly what it is they're supposed to be doing. And one of the things that I often say is clear communication brings about relaxation. Uncertainty can be very anxiety producing, uh, not only for horses, but also humans. You know, think about COVID and all of the uncertainty that that brought to all of our lives and that was anxiety producing for a lot of us if we have a predictable environment if we know that our you know our job is secure and we're going to be safe and there's no threat to our safety then we're going to feel like we can relax a whole lot more so even just that certainty of knowing of the horse knowing how to navigate their human, how to respond to pressure, that helps them to relax. Horses can be tense and anxious due to a lack of preparation. So your horse feels like they've been thrown in the deep end. Uh, that could be like um, you taking your horse, your unbroken horse or unstarted horse to a new environment and deciding I'm going to ride them. It's like, whoa, that you have combined so many new experiences there all at the same time. That's going to be really overloading for that horse. In general, I like to break things down into really small steps, only changing one thing at a time. So it's a really systematic and sequential process for the horse. So I'm avoiding throwing them in the deep end. And look, that doesn't mean that sometimes we accidentally might take a big step or we purposely take a big step and actually the horse is okay. But usually that's as a result of the horse already building up enough trust in whoever is training them before we go taking slightly larger steps. And also a good trainer recognizes when they have gone too far and will go back to previous steps. Horses can be tense, anxious, spooky, etc. when they've had a previous bad experience. 
And I see this a lot in horses, you know, who have aversions to bridling, to worming, to getting on a float, because horses are naturally quite curious. So when they are showing extreme uh, behavior against these things, it tells me that they've had a bad experience before and it's our job to go back to square one and help to make it a positive experience again, which again is one of my principles, make potentially negative things a positive thing. And horses can also be tense, anxious, fearful, spooky, etc. if what you're doing is causing them pain. So your horse might be anticipating pain from equipment, from the movement, from the situation, or they might have an underlying issue. So after considering why your horse might be behaving in this way or the underlying reason, I want you to think about when this tension is first showing up. So that's the third point that I want to make that the problem is probably showing up sooner than you think. The tension, the anxiety is probably showing up way sooner than you think. And again, um, we talk about trigger stacking and technically trigger stacking is the combination of multiple stressful events in a short period of time, leading to an extreme reaction to a small stimulus. For example, your horse is in season and it's a windy day that's two triggers already. You arrive at your horse and you're already tense from your day at work. Um, You go to catch your horse and a small branch falls off of a tree nearby and the horse in the adjacent paddock starts galloping around. That's already five triggers. On the way to the arena, a, um, a fox jumps out and your horse spooks but you just carry on and then you get to the arena and someone has moved the jump barrels to a different location. Uh, A car drives past um, as you mount and makes loud sounds and spooks your horse. And um, you, as a result, because you were kind of halfway in the air, you land heavy in the saddle, right? Already that's over 10 triggers. Then later in the ride, you ask your horse to canter, which he's done successfully many times in the past and even the day before, and he explodes and starts bronking. And you think, all I did was ask for a canter. Where did that come from? Edit. I just realized that I changed the sex of the horse halfway through my story um, because I said that the horse is in season and then later I said he. But anyway, I digress. But I mean, you can probably laugh and logically reason as to why that would have happened when I do explain it in this way because there were all of these little triggers along the way. But we do sometimes as humans tend to have blinkers on and we kind of ignore all of these little triggers, especially when we've been able to successfully ride our horse in the past in the same conditions. I really encourage you to approach your horse with fresh eyes every single day and really help them with the tension that shows up as soon as it shows up. I'm sure we've all been in situations similar to this where maybe we've ignored the horse's initial signs of worry or we don't know how to help them with those initial worries, so we just carry on anyway. For me, training with my horses starts at the very start. Not even when I catch my horse, it's when my horse first sees me. Every interaction is important and our horses are very aware of what we're doing and what we're not doing. Early in the episode, I described an extreme version of a tense, anxious horse, but there are also more subtle versions of tension like swishing tails, pricked or pinned ears, a high head carriage, choppy movement, um, a tense jaw or tense muscles, not wanting to go forwards or not wanting to stop. And, you know, I list these off, but I also need to say that sometimes these things happen, um, you know, and it's not related to tension. So you do need to take in the individual context. And I always like to... I I do observe these individual uh, signs of tension, but I try to more focus on the overall feeling of the horse. But when you're learning, I think it's good to kind of point out these um, individual things. You might be thinking, how time consuming to have to deal with every single little anxiety that comes up. But by showing your horse that you notice their worry, you build their trust. 
And think about how much easier it it is to help a horse relax when it's just a little bit of tension versus when they're already way over threshold, running, pulling away, etc. I always say to my students, fix a problem when it's a 1 out of 10 before it becomes a 10 out of 10 and it's much harder to fix. Kind of like cleaning your house, right? Hopefully you do the dishes every day. You might do a load of washing every day. You might just wipe over surfaces every now and then because you know it's much easier to keep your house clean when you fix those little problems then and there rather than letting it build up over time and then you have to do a massive spring clean overhaul. And look, sometimes with our houses, that's necessary. But hopefully with your horses, if you address these small signs of worry, you won't even get to those larger explosions. So think to yourself, when is my horse first showing me that they are not okay? And in in those moments, help your horse relax. But to do so, you might need some skills, which we'll get into in a moment. But before that, I think it's important to look in the mirror. So the fourth point is I want you to look at your own tension and anxiety. How are you showing up to your horse? Are you generally an anxious or tense person? Can you stay calm when your horse gets worried so you can help your horse in that situation instead of adding to it? Your own energy and intention really does matter. And there was a time when I thought that energy, I thought it was just a bit hippy dippy and didn't really matter. Um, to horses but the more and more I have experience with horses the more I learn energy really is so vital and important and so it's important for us to cultivate a really nice energy and relaxing energy to be around think about the sort of person that you would want to be with in a scary situation so imagine you're walking down a really dark scary alleyway Do you want to be with your friend who's also equally as jumpy and frightened and scared as you are? Or do you want to be with uh, like your dad or your, um, your boss or your brother or your boyfriend or whoever it is in your life who is a source of safety for you? Someone who you feel like they've got me. I can trust them. Like I feel like they're going to make wise decisions for us and they're going to protect me. It's that kind of energy you want to give your horse. Like, hey, I've got you. You're going to be safe with me. I also think that your intention that you bring to your horse when you're trying to help them through tension is important as well. Like your horse can feel the difference between when you're feeling like, oh, just hurry up and relax, horse. Like I've got things to do. I've only got an hour. Like I want to help you, but this is just annoying. Can you just hurry up? Versus hey, I can see you're worried. Like I can take as long as you need to help you relax here. I've got your back. It's okay if we don't get to the other stuff today. What's most important is how you feel. Something that I learned from Karen Rolf, she said in one of uh, a video that I watched, she said, followers watch the leader. Leaders focus on what they're doing. And I always say a leader is someone with a plan. So in a moment of crisis, when either people or horses are freaking out and they're worried, if someone is like sure of themselves and they've got a plan, generally people look to them. And I find that that's the case with horses as well. Um, and I'll, I'll touch, that, touch on that a little bit more in a moment when I talk about skills. And when I talk about leadership, I don't mean a domination, a situation where the horse must do what I say no matter what. That's not what I'm talking about. But in any relationship, really, there is someone who's leading the conversation. And in a moment where my horse is tense and anxious, I feel like they're not in a state where they can um, effectively take on that leadership role. And I need to be the leader in that situation to help them through in the most positive way. So of course you can work on your fear and your mindset away from the horse, like doing um, yoga, meditation, visualization, etc. But for me, and I think that's all really important, but for me to really have confidence and therefore remain calm in a situation, 
I need to know what I'm doing and I need to know that I can handle the situation and keep myself safe so that I can be calm. I need to have a plan and I need to be confident in my skills and tools and know that the plan is going to work for me to be like this source of just chill, relaxed, calm and safety for my horse. Because I can have a great mindset and be completely fearless But without skill and knowledge, I will still get hurt and be unsuccessful at helping my horse relax. You need both the ability to remain calm and the skills to help your horse in that situation. And the good thing is that the calmer you are, the better your skills will be. And the better your skills are, the calmer you will be also. So it works both ways. I also like to think if, you know, I'm working with a horse who's a little bit um, tense or I know has a tendency to be easily spooked, etc. I want to think, how else can I make myself more relaxed? You know, like maybe by putting on some calming music, maybe by just allowing myself an extra hour, knowing that I don't have that time pressure. Maybe I lower my expectations. I take the pressure off myself. So... I can be more relaxed um, knowing that I don't have a specific thing that I need to achieve. So know yourself, know your own moods as well and know what triggers you and learn to upskill and have confidence in the skills and techniques that you have to help your horse. Which brings me to the fifth point. Are you feeling a little stuck or lost with your horse? Are you worried that you'll do the wrong thing by your horse? Are you confused with conflicting advice? Do you feel like you can't keep your horse's focus and attention? Do you wish your horse would look to you for guidance and security? Would you like your time together to be a good experience for both of you? Do you just want to be able to communicate clearly with your horse so you can stop worrying about everything going wrong and actually start to enjoy yourself and achieve your horse dreams? Well, I have the perfect solution for you. Introducing Horsemanship Fundamentals Academy, also known as HFA for short. Inside of HFA, I teach you how to create the partnership you've always dreamed of, how to understand and connect with your horse, show your horse how to understand you on the ground and in the saddle, build confidence and relaxation in yourself and your horse, and implement the essential foundation for a willing, calm, trusting, and happy riding partner no matter what your discipline is. When you sign up, you get access to an online platform where all the HFA content is hosted, and this is accessible on desktop or mobile devices. The Academy platform has eight fundamental modules, and each module has mindset audios to overcome common roadblocks, theory videos so you can deeply understand the what, how, and why, and practical videos with various horses so you can see horse training in action. Each module builds on the previous, and we cover everything you need to know for groundwork, riding preparation, and riding. You also get access to a members-only Facebook group to connect with and receive support from other like-minded horse riders, and you can ask questions in the group anytime. Horsemanship Fundamentals Academy is the ultimate blend of practical horsemanship knowledge and skills, mindset, support, and positivity you need to succeed with your horse. If you're listening to this podcast, you're probably my kind of equestrian, a heart-centered horse person who wants the best for their horse and is committed to making their horse dreams a reality. If that sounds like you, I would love to have you inside the academy and support you on your horsemanship journey. If you want to find out more and sign up, just head to AmaliaDempsey.com and click on Academy. And have confidence in the skills and techniques that you have to help your horse. Which brings me to the fifth point. Learn skills and techniques to build confidence and relaxation. If I were to ask you what techniques you use to help your horse relax, would you know exactly what to say? Do you have them straight away in your toolbox ready to use? So how do you help your horse relax when the tension first shows up? Like I mentioned earlier, it's good to help them when it first shows up. I have to say, if you have enough communication and connection with your horse, sometimes just waiting until they naturally relax themselves is enough. 
Now I have a whole module on building confidence and relaxation with my horses in Horsemanship Fundamentals Academy. And you can find out more about that at AmaliaDempsey.com. And I, but I want to talk about some of the techniques that I use um, now. But if you don't aren't familiar with these things and you need to see it in action and you need more support and more information, definitely sign up for HFA because you will completely change the way you do things with horses. So you may have heard of desensitizing before. And desensitizing is when a horse gets less sensitive in response to a stimulus, essentially. It's mostly seen as rope twirling and flag waving, but it's so much more than that. I actually don't really like the word um, desensitizing, but it is used a lot in the horsemanship community. I really like instead to talk about building confidence and relaxation. So I think I will use the word desensitizing just for clarity. I think desensitizing is essential for horses who are nervous, tense, anxious, etc. because it helps them learn that they actually don't need to be afraid. And depending on your application, it shows them that you're not going to force the scary thing on them. So I want to talk about five different techniques of building confidence and relaxation that I go over and teach in my academy and that I think is important for every horse person to know about um, and use with their horses. Okay, so the first is systematic desensitization, otherwise known as approach and retreat. Now this, uh, well, I have to say the devil is in the detail because it really, approach and retreat is great, but it really depends on how you're actually using approach and retreat. Some people and some situations you would approach with the scary, let's say it's um, a plastic bag and the person, the horse is worried about a plastic bag. Some trainers will put the plastic bag on the horse. The horse is noticeably scared. They will keep the plastic bag in that spot until the horse shows signs of relaxation and then they will remove the plastic bag. Okay, that's one way of doing approach and retreat. So you're approaching with the plastic bag, waiting for the horse to relax. When, uh, whilst the bag is in that same position, the horse relaxes, you remove the plastic bag. The other way of doing approach and retreat is you move towards an area that the horse is worried about with the plastic bag. When you first notice that the horse is worried, then you retreat. And in doing so, you're showing your horse hey, I'm actually not going to force you to relax with this. I'm actually just going to notice when you're worried and retreat to show you that, hey, it's okay. Like as as soon as I see that you're worried, I'm going to back off. So they're very different ways of doing approach and retreat. And I have used both ways. I mostly use the second way, um, but in some cases I will use the first way as well. Um, anyway, so the second technique is overshadowing. And I call this be more distracting than the distraction. So I will also use the analogy of a focus bubble. I talk about a focus bubble. So if you, I can't remember if I've mentioned it on the podcast before, but anyway, if you imagine this huge bubble, like a sphere around you and your horse. Now, the bubble is only as big as yours and your horse's focus. So if your horse looks off into the distance, like, you know, 300 meters out into the distance, your focus bubble is 300 meters in diameter. But the more your horse starts to focus on you, that focus bubble shrinks down. And I want that focus bubble to be really tight around me and my horse when we're communicating with each other on the ground and in the saddle. And so overshadowing is where you you basically will provide a stimulus that's more uh, distracting than whatever it is that they're looking at. And again, the devil is in the detail. Some people do this in a pretty harsh way. Other people will do it in a more subtle way. I think about more um, picking a task, an easy task that the horse already knows and playing with that with your focus really on point until the horse starts to relax. 
So that's oversh- overshadowing in a nutshell. I almost feel a bit funny giving you all this information in a podcast because there is so much more detail to just the words that I'm telling you right now. But I just wanted to let you know that there are these techniques out there and I think it's worthwhile learning them. The next technique is approach conditioning. So we've gone over, this is the third. Approach conditioning is basically approaching the scary object. And when the horse makes an advancement towards the scary object, the scary object is removed. So horses do build confidence in following something. And I find this technique really valuable for things like cars, bikes, things that dogs, things that tend to move, um, but you need to be able to control Uh, how the moving thing is moving because you want it to be really systematic in that when the horse shows curiosity and confidence, the scary thing moves further away. The fourth technique is counter conditioning. So this is related to my principle, which is turn a potentially negative thing into a positive thing. So if your horse hates to be washed or bridled or put on the float, how can you, or worms, how can you turn this around so that they love it? Right, It sort of makes sense, really. If you want a horse to be confident with something, how can you make it like a really positive experience? Um, So I've spoken about my molasses worming on the podcast before where I actually tube my horses with molasses so that it's a positive experience with a tube. Or, um, you know, floating. Does your horse ever get to just, do you ever load your horse onto the float and just let them stand there for 10 minutes and eat a loosen, uh, loosen hay bag? Like, you know, do they ever, or is it always that you load them up and off they go and it's a scary experience? So you want to change your horse's mind that not only is this thing not scary, it's actually really awesome and I love it. So that's counter conditioning. Um, the next and the fifth, technique is called stimulus blending, which is where you combine something he already knows and he's comfortable with, uh, with something he's afraid of. So an example of that would be, uh, if my horse is totally okay with me rubbing them with my hand, but they're not okay with me rubbing them with a plastic bag, I can sort of combine those two things together. So the horse kind of associates the negative thing with something that he's okay with like, Oh, that kind of feels the same as my, as your hand rubbing me. So it must be okay. Now, I want to say that there is a sixth technique called flooding, and it's generally not recommended. Um, It's basically where you just flood the horse with scary stimuli and they're just kind of forced to relax because they have no option to escape. And an example of this would just be if your horse is afraid of plastic bags, it's just to put plastic bags all over your horse, even if they're worried, and wait for them just to deal with it. Um, And now I'm told that this can actually work, But I think it's very stressful for the horses and there's a high potential for things to go seriously wrong and for for them to either injure themselves or someone else. And again, like I said, the devil is in the detail. It's not enough just to hear these things and go, yep, I've got it. I can just go out and do these things now. You might need to see it in action and really break it down and get some coaching around these techniques if you don't know them. And as I said, I talk about and demonstrate these in more detail in HFA. Something I often say to my students is clear communication brings about relaxation, which is why the next point is all about clear communication. So if your horse has clarity and predictability when they're with you, then they're likely to be more relaxed and you'll be more successful at communicating with them in times when they really need your help. Right, Because if you haven't built up that communication in the relaxed times, then when you actually need to communicate with them, uh, you don't have a language, like you you can't communicate with them. It's kind of like maybe if you were going to another country that doesn't speak English, you would learn some of their language beforehand, not just get there and hope for the best because that's going to be a lot more difficult. So don't wait for your horse to be tense before you start to decide to do groundwork. Teach them your communication in a place where they do feel relaxed and get that really solid before you need to use it when the horse is anxious. And usually your communication doesn't work as well in a stressful situation. So your groundwork won't be as polished and refined in a stressful situation. So it needs to be really good and really clear when your horse is relaxed So it has a chance of working to some level when your horse is tense. 
Everything that you ask your horse to do from leading to tying up to floating, saddling, lunging, mounting, etc., you want to know that you have total communication around it and your horse is totally clear on what they're supposed to do in that moment. And I generally build communication around movement in two different ways. The first is light touch. So wherever you physically contact your horse with the intention for them to move, you want to be able to train them to move. And the second is at a distance. So through your body language and maybe perhaps through some rhythmic pressure with intention, we'd like them to be able to move their body. And in these two ways, so through light touch and at a distance, I want to be able to ask the horse to go backwards, forwards, move the front legs independently and the hind legs independently, bend left and right and lower the head. And so if I can do those things, I can ask my horse to do almost anything. And I want to be able to ask my horse to do those things to a really high level through light touch and at a distance so I have a really solid communication to use in the event that I might need it. This communication also helps you to be safe when your horse is tense because you can use that communication to keep them at a distance from you and to help them refocus, which can result in relaxation. So I don't know if you've ever been around a tense, spooky horse and they're like almost on top of you. Like it can feel really scary because it's kind of dangerous. But imagine if you had the communication to say, you're allowed to be afraid, but you need to be, you know, four meters away from me. And your horse understands that healthy boundary. And again, if you don't know how to teach your horse this communication on the ground, then I encourage you to join Horsemanship Fundamentals Academy to find out exactly how to do that. So build clear communication before you actually need it. And having those clear, healthy boundaries can help keep you safe as well as your horse. The seventh point is all about environment and the elements. And this really is kind of one of the reasons as to why some horses can get anxious and tense but I wanted to talk about it because I think it's really important to consider it and uh, learn how to adapt to help our horses when they are facing a change in the environment or elements. Environment can make a huge difference. We all know that horses can tend to be a little bit more fresh in the spring, they tend to be a bit more spooky in windy weather. Horses in general tend to like big open spaces so they can see what's in the distance and what's coming. So sometimes smaller, darker areas can be more spooky, um, especially if there are more shadows and um, things like that where they can't fully work out, you know, if there's a predator behind a tree or, you know, they we know that there's no lions around, but they don't know that. They're always thinking about their safety. So this, again, comes back to one of my principles Think from your horse's perspective. It's much harder to see if a predator is coming if there are lots of shadows, corners, bushes, or puddles. So it can be harder for horses to relax in these environments. So you kind of, it's not to say never put your horse in that environment, but you need to kind of cut them some slack if they're not used to those environments. New environments can make your horse tense also, and it doesn't have to be a different location. Um, like completely off the property. It could just be the arena versus the paddock or a different area of the property. Or maybe the arena is far away from other horses. That can also be an environmental factor that makes a horse worried. I have found that the scariest places for horses are ones that are isolated from other horses. So if they can't actually see any other horses in sight, this can be one of the more challenging situations for horses. And again, it doesn't mean you can't ride your horse away from other horses, but if your horse is showing signs of anxiety away from others, you might need to help with that. And um, I'd recommend you listen to my separation anxiety episode for that. Adjustments can sometimes be a little unsettling or anxiety producing or provoking for horses because there tends to be a lot more horses moving around and a lot more changes happening. Um, you know, so you might be riding and someone else, uh, catches your horse's friend and takes them to a different arena. Like they're always kind of aware of where other horses are at and, and what's happening in their environment and changes to that can produce some anxiety. So the point that I want to make around environment and the elements is be aware that these things can have a big impact on how your horse feels and therefore behaves. 
help your horse in different environments so that they're well prepared and have good experiences of working through tension or coming to a place of relaxation when they are in an environment that they're a little bit worried about. Have a plan. In HFA, I have a what I call a relaxed first outing sequence audio where I walk you through how to take your horse somewhere new and have it be a positive experience. And if you notice that the environment or the elements are affecting, affecting your horse, perhaps go slower, lower your expectations so you can maybe adjust your goals so you can be successful and have it be a positive experience for you and your horse. So they are the seven steps or seven kind of points that I wanted to touch on when it comes to helping your tense, anxious, spooky horse be more relaxed and calm. And I want to finish by saying that every horse is an individual. It's a common theme in these podcasts. Every uh, trainer that I've spoken to talks about treating the horse as an individual. And like humans, different things relax different people. So um, with horses, different things can help relax different horses. So for example, um, some people get more relaxed in like a social setting, whereas other humans, they get more relaxed when they're alone. Some people exercise helps them to relax and others meditation helps more. So for some horses, the longer they look at something, sometimes the worse they get. And for others, they need to look to feel okay about it. Some horses need to move their feet to feel relaxed and others prefer to stand still, or at least they seem to get more relaxed when they stand still. Some horses have particular anxieties like humans. For example, some humans are afraid of heights and they're just naturally afraid of that. Whereas others love heights and will, and will you know, jump out of planes and do things like that. Some people don't really like... Um, certain animals or they're afraid of certain people and horses are the same maybe innate maybe they were born like that maybe they've had a bad experience so some horses don't like going into water or they don't like dogs or they don't like men or um yeah like I said it could be learned or it could just be an innate fear that they have so know your individual horse learn what helps them relax have a fire plan so make sure you practice your fire plan so that's like a drill that you go through essentially to help in a smaller calm moment to help your horse relax even further and most of all really think about your horse's perspective and empathize with your horse when they are showing that they're afraid of something Now, after having said all of this and giving you lots of different ideas on how to help your tense, anxious, spooky, fearful horse be more relaxed and calm, I do want to say that horses are horses, right? They're animals, they're living, breathing beings, and they're very unlikely to be exactly the same from day to day. There's certainly things we can do to help our horses relax and be more calm. But if you want your horse to be 100% relaxed 100% of the time, I just don't think that that is really an achievable goal. I do think that some horses are generally more highly strung or spirited than others. And again, yes, there's certainly things we can do to help them be more relaxed However, if you want your really spirited horse to be like a really chilled out uh, trail riding horse um, and you only want to ride them once a month, you know, sometimes there are horses for courses. Some horses need a human who's willing to take the time every single session to help them feel relaxed and calm before riding. And other horses, they find that place of relaxation a lot quicker than others for various reasons. So I just wanted to say it's unrealistic to expect your horse to be calm and relaxed all of the time. They're horses at the end of the day. The main thing is that you notice when they are afraid and you help them through those moments with the toolbox that you have. And if you don't have one, you learn how to do so. So just to recap, make sure that your horse has their basic needs met so they can live a relaxed life when you're not there. Think about why your horse could be tense. Consider when the tension is first showing up and help them there. Check in with your own anxiety levels and work on your own skills. 
So know your toolkit and learn the skills and techniques to help horses relax. Build clear communication through groundwork and consider the environment and the elements so you can set yourself up for success. And of course, every horse is an individual. Thank you for joining me for today's episode. I hope you learnt a lot and hopefully you've got a few more ideas on how to help your horse be more calm and relaxed. Thanks for listening to the Horsemanship Breakthroughs podcast. Make sure you hit the follow button so you get notified every time a new episode is released. And if you've learned even just one small thing from today's show, I would really appreciate if you could leave a review on Apple Podcasts or screenshot this episode and share it on social media. You can connect with me on Instagram at Amalia underscore horses or my website AmaliaDempsey.com where you can find free resources to help you on your horsemanship journey. That's all for today. Thanks for being here. Remember to train with kindness and ride with excellence and I'll see you in the next episode. 